Good evening and welcome to the final presentation in a three part series on specific learning disorders. I would like to thank Ocean, Claire and Brittany for their tremendous commitment to bring you these sessions. In addition to their university course load, they dedicated themselves fully to this project. Parts one and two have been very well received by both parents and educators alike. I did send out the recording of part one today to all those who are registered. If you did not get it, please visit the link that is in the chat box and you can watch that video. I also sent the event materials. If you didn't receive them, pop me a message in the chat box or to ces at ahs.ca and I will get those to you immediately. Finally, please welcome back Ocean and Claire for their final presentation with CES for now, as we hope they will present again as they complete their studies. Over to you. Territorial Acknowledgement. Community Education Service acknowledges that the land on which we virtually gather today is the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending the final presentation in our series on specific learning disorders. Tonight, we'll be discussing specific learning disorders with impairment in mathematics, what parents and teachers should know. I'll be presenting alongside my colleague, Claire. As you already know, if you've attended part one and part two, my name is Ocean Medianka. I'm a master's student in the School of Applied Child Psychology program at the University of Calgary. Prior to moving to Alberta, I completed my Bachelor of Arts Honors degree in Psychology at the University of Regina. I'm passionate about collaborating with students, their parents, and teachers to develop and implement strategies that help students reach their full academic potential and experience enhanced mental well-being. And my name is Claire, as some of you may know, and I'm currently a PhD student in the University of Calgary School and Applied Child Psychology program. I completed my master's degree at the University of Calgary and my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto. Over the last few years, I worked with a number of children through tutoring, volunteering in a kindergarten classroom, and working in a variety of research settings looking at child development. I have a passion for working with children to help them succeed socially, emotionally, and academically. I also enjoy working with teachers and parents to develop a plan of support. These are our learning objectives for today. We want you to understand the core components of a specific learning disorder with impairment in mathematics, to acquire knowledge about the referral and testing process for psychoeducational assessments, and to learn about specific evidence-based resources to help students, families, and school personnel teams navigate students' unique academic challenges. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll answer as many as possible at the end. If we don't get to your question and you would like an answer to it, please email ces at ahs.ca and we'll respond to your questions. To begin, Claire will define and explain what a learning disorder is. All right, so this may be familiar from our last two presentations. So we'll just go over briefly about what a learning disorder is. A learning disorder is a neurological disorder that affects the way a person stores, understands, retrieves, and or communicates information. Learning disorders are invisible and lifelong and can occur alongside other disorders. For example, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and anxiety. It is crucial to understand that learning disorders are not the same as intellectual disabilities, indicating that intelligence is not a contributing factor to the difficulties experienced by those with a learning disorder. Living with a learning disorder can have an ongoing impact on friendships, school, work, self-esteem, and daily life. However, people with learning disorders can succeed when solid coping skills and strategies are developed, and that's why we're here today to discuss.
So how is a learning disorder diagnosed? There are two different definitions of a learning disorder that can be used to assess a student's difficulties. First is the DSM, or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and the other is LDAC, or the Learning Disabilities of Canada. The DSM states that a learning disorder is when an individual has difficulties learning and using academic skills that persist for a period of six months or longer, despite the provision of interventions that target those difficulties. According to the DSM, the affected academic skills must be substantially and quantifiably below those expected for individuals' age as confirmed by a clinical assessment that we'll discuss later on in the presentation. The learning difficulties have to begin during school age years, but may not become fully manifested until the demands of those affected academic skills exceed the individual's limited capacities. The second definition psychologists often use to diagnose learning disabilities is the Learning Disabilities Association of Canada that disorders, it states, <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, it indicates that learning disabilities refer to a number of disorders which may affect the acquisition, organization, retention, understanding, and use of verbal or nonverbal information. These disorders affect learning in individuals who otherwise demonstrate at least average abilities essential for thinking and or reasoning. There are three specific learning disorders, reading, math, and written expression. It is not uncommon for a student to be diagnosed with more than one of these at a time. However, today's presentation will be focused on difficulties with mathematics. Did you know a specific learning disorder in math affects 5% to 15% of school age children? So a specific learning disorder in mathematics is characterized by difficulty with number sense, such as having poor understanding of numbers, their magnitude and relationships, difficulties with memorization of arithmetic facts, could look like counting on fingers to add single digit numbers instead of recalling the math facts. Difficulties with accurate or fluent calculation may look like getting lost in the midst of arithmetic com computation and may switch procedures. Difficulties with accurate math reasoning can look like difficulty applying mathematical concepts, facts, or procedures to solve quantitative problems. Learning disorders can range in severity based on the number of skill areas affected and the intensity of the student's difficulties. Typically, the more skill areas that are affected, the higher the degree of impairment, and in turn, the more severe the learning disorder. A mild specific learning disorder would be diagnosed if a student has some difficulties learning skills in one or two academic domains, and they may be able to function well when provided with appropriate accommodations and supports. A moderate specific learning disorder would be diagnosed when an individual has difficulty learning skills in one or more academic domains, and um, they also are unlikely to become proficient without some intensive and specialized teaching. And then a severe specific learning disorder would be diagnosed when one has severe difficulties learning skills affecting several academic domains. And this individual is unlikely to learn those skills without ongoing intensive individualized and specialized teaching. Even with an array of appropriate accommodations or services, this individual may not be able to complete all academic activities efficiently. Dyscalculia is an alternative term used to refer to a pattern of difficulties characterized by problems processing numerical information, learning arithmetic facts, and performing accurate or fluent calculations. If the term dyscalcul dyscalculia is used to specify this particular pattern of mathematical difficulties, it is important also to specify any additional difficulties that are present such as difficulties with math reasoning or word reasoning accuracy. All right, so now that we talked about what a learning disorder is 
and specifically what a specific learning disorder in math is. We will go on to talk about different components in math from basic skills to more complex skills. Informal mathematics happens within the first five years of life before children are taught written mathematics in school. For example, judgments of relative magnitude and addition by counting happens before school. By age four to five, children are relatively proficient in practical arithmetic. For example, at age four, a child may know that five is greater than three and may be able to add five and three mentally by counting one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight. Children acquire informal mathematics spontaneously through interactions with the environment, imitation of adults, and watching TV. However, without formal mathematics education, children can manipulate only small numbers. Formal education of mathematics is required to learn advanced skills, such as working with large numbers, multiplication, division, and fractions. The cardinality principle is important for both informal and formal mathematics. It is an individual's ability to recognize that the last number word used in counting represents the total number of items in a collection or group. For example, if you see a collection or group of items like the ducks in this image, you would recognize that after counting them, there are four ducks, as the written word four is the last one that appears when counting chronologically from left to right. Understanding the cardinality principle is a foundational developmental milestone in early numeracy. It underlies meaningful one-to-one -one subject counting and allows children to respond meaningful meaningfully to how many questions when a collection or group of items is beyond their subsidizing range. That's their ability to look at a group or collection of items and immediately recognize how many items are present. The cardinality principle also plays a critical role in generalizing information about mathematical patterns and relationships from a small subsidizable group to a large group beyond an individual subsidizing range. Furthermore, children cannot connect number words later in the counting sequence to quantify until they've developed the cardinality principle. Also, cardinality appears to be a prerequisite skill for understanding the equivalence principle. That's the ability to recognize that two groups are equal and the successor principle, the ability to understand that adding exactly one object to a set means moving forward exactly one word in the list. Like if we were to add another duck to this image, it would move from the written word four to the written word five. Finally, the cardinality principle appears to underlie advanced counting strategies such as counting on. For example, starting a count from a number word such as five instead of one and being able to count forward from there as well as informally adding on. So solving five and three more by starting with the cardinal term five and counting six, seven, eight, instead of counting all. Due to its underlying importance in numeracy, understanding the cardinality principle is a key mathematical goal that is set in preschool and kindergarten. Most children are typically able to employ the skill between three and five years of age. So it's important to teach the cardinality principle because even children who have mastered one-to-one -one counting may not inherently understand the concept of cardinality. If children do not understand cardinality, they may recount all the items in a group or collection when asked how many items are present. Conversely, others simply learn to repeat the last number word from counting when an adult asks them how many items there are in a collection or group. These children do this without meaningfully understanding that the last number they've counted is how many items are in the group or collection. They have simply learned that repeating the last number they've counted satisfies the adult asking the question of how many items are in the group or collection. Some children may experience difficulties learning the cardinality principle due to the nature in which the concept is typically taught. Unfortunately, adults often do not model the cardinality principle in a helpful manner. There's currently contradictory information 
information regarding the most effective way to model the cardinality principle. Mix and his colleagues indicate that labeling a collection with its cardinal value, so the total first, and then counting is the most effective way to teach cardinality. Whereas Palawal and Broody indicate that counting a collection first and then emphasizing the cardinal value is the most efficacious way to teach cardinality because it places the last number word of a count in closer temporal order to a collection or group's cardinal label the last number counted. Both of these approaches use structure mapping. So this is the process of creating connections in the brain between concepts in order to reflect and understand similarities and differences between constructs. And they use this to teach children the relationship between between counting and cardinality. For instance, counting a collection of three items, one, two, three, and naming it three creates an opportunity to notice that the last number word used in the counting process is the same as the collection's total, the cardinal label. Due to contradictory evidence regarding the best approach used to teach cardinality, further research must be done to explore if, how, or why one strategy might be more efficacious and effective than the other when teaching students the cardinality principle. Another key concept that underlies mathematical abilities is symbolic knowledge. Claire will discuss this concept in our next slide. Okay, so the symbolic language of math is a distinct special purpose language that has its own rules of grammar that are quite different from those of English. You can usually read math expressions in any math article written in any language. Informally, we teach children the connection of a number word to a specific quantity for example, when we say, oh, I dropped four of the crayons. If you do this continuously, you are encouraging children to think of the world in terms of numbers and how to recognize numbers. Symbolic knowledge such as this is an important foundation of number skills, such as counting and more sophisticated abilities, and therefore is an important predictor of later math achievements. We tend to think of math as all numbers, but there's actually quite a bit of language learning that goes on in the math class. Students need to learn the two are students need to learn the two or more different meanings for certain math words. Words they thought they knew, like face, mean something else once math class starts. In addition, they learn words such as quadrilateral or decimal point. However, sometimes we use those different words in different contexts. For example, when we read a number aloud that has a decimal point, we don't usually call it decimal point. We say end. It makes teaching math also extremely difficult when we learn that almost 50% of children with math disabilities also have reading disabilities, which creates a double whammy. So why is it important that we teach math vocabulary? We should focus on teaching math vocabulary because by teaching the language of math, it helps us to have conversations and understand what, other, what the other person means. Number sense is about seeing patterns and relationships between numbers. Students with strong number sense can visualize and talk comfortably about numbers, take numbers apart and put them back together in different ways, compute mentally, and relate numbers to real life problems by connecting them to their everyday world. Counting is the basis for many different math concepts, including comp computation, place value, estimation, and understanding fractions and decimals. Developing strong number sense and counting skills will build a solid foundation for mastering concepts in the later grades. The most difficult part of counting for students is making that leap to memorization. In order to count, a student needs to have that symbolic knowledge we talked about, and they also need to have the cardinality principle that Ocean talked about. So how can teachers and parents help kids learn to count? 
Well, it is okay, and in fact, it's a good idea to let kids use their fingers to count. You might think counting on their fingers it is, is an immature counting strategy, but it is actually so helpful, as our minds can hold about seven items of information at a time. When young children are practicing counting, they haven't mastered the scale yet, and so they hold a lot of information in their mind such as which objects they've already counted, the sequence of counting words, which number they just said, etc. Using their fingers or other manipulatives reduces the amount of information the child needs to keep in their minds at once, making it easier to count. Another strategy is to practice counting, such as bringing counting into everyday life. This can be counting the number of stairs in a staircase, or counting the number of goldfish in their snack. Now that we understand the foundational skills and prerequisites required to learn math, let's explore the specific components or strands that allow individuals to be proficient in mathematics. Specifically, there are five strands or components that make up mathematical proficiency. They are conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, strategic competence, adaptive reasoning, and productive disposition. Each of these strands are interwoven and interdependent in the development of mathematical proficiency. As such, mathematical proficiency is a multidimensional trait. Therefore, it can only be achieved by focusing on acquiring mastery within all five strands of mathematical proficiency. Simply focusing on mastering skills within one or two of these domains will not be sufficient when aiming to be proficient in mathematics. These five strands provide a framework for discussing the knowledge, skills, abilities, and beliefs that comprise mathematics mathematical proficiency. First, we'll discuss conceptual knowledge. This refers to a child or student's comprehension of mathematical concepts, operations, and the way that they relate to one another. Children with conceptual knowledge of arithmetic understand why a mathematical idea is important and the kinds of contexts in which it's useful. They can mentally organize what they already know about mathematics in their mind, which allows them to learn new ideas by connecting those ideas to their previous knowledge and understanding. This provides them with a deeper level of mathematical understanding than would typically be achieved by pure memorization alone. Interestingly, most children develop a conceptual understanding of mathematics long before adults are even aware. This is because most students acquire this knowledge, but they cannot immediately verbalize their understanding and inform others of it. A significant indicator of conceptual understanding is being able to represent mathematical situations in different ways and knowing how different representations can be useful for different purposes and contexts. It is important to see how the various representations connect with each other, how they're similar, and how they might be different. Furthermore, knowledge that this has been learned with understanding provides the basis for generating new knowledge for solving novel and unfamiliar problems. For example, students who understand place value and other multi-digit number concepts are more likely than students without such understanding to invent their own procedures for multi-column addition and to adopt correct procedures for multi-column subtraction when solving multi-digit math problems. Now let's move on to procedural fluency. Procedural fluency is a child or student's ability to carry out procedures flexibly, accurately, efficiently, and appropriately. It supports conceptual understanding of place value and the meaning of rational numbers. It also aids in the analysis of similarities and differences between different methods of calculating. Students need to be efficient and accurate in performing basic computations with whole numbers, such as six plus seven, without always having to rely on tables or other aids. They also need to know reasonably efficient and accurate ways to add, subtract, multiply, and divide multi-digit numbers, both mentally and with a paper and pencil. A good conceptual understanding of place value in the base 10 system supports the development of fluency in multi-digit computation. Students also need to be able to apply procedures flexibly, since not all computational situations are alike. 
For example, students should be able to perform operations such as finding the sum of 199 and 67 by using quick mental strategies rather than relying on a paper and pencil. Without sufficient procedural fluency, students have trouble deepening their understanding of mathematical ideas or solving mathematical problems. The attention they devote to working out results they should recall or compute easily prevents them from seeing important relationships between mathematical concepts. Next, we'll talk about strategic competence. This is a child or student's ability to formulate, represent, and solve mathematical problems. Other common names for this strand of mathematical proficiency are problem solving and problem formulation. Students should know a variety of solution strategies as well as strategies as well as which strategies might be useful for solving a specific problem. This helps them become strategically competent. Becoming strategically competent involves an avoidance of number grabbing methods. So these are methods in which students select numbers and prepare to perform arithmetic operations on them in favor of methods that generate problem models. So these are methods in which the student constructs a mental model of the variables and the relationships described in the problem. To represent a problem accurately, students must first understand the situation, including its key features. They then need to generate a mathematical representation of the problem that captures the four mathematical elements and ignores the irrelevant features. Novice problem solvers are inclined to notice similarities in surface features of the problem, such as the characters or scenarios described in the problem. More expert problem solvers focus more on the structural relationships within problems, relationships that provide the clues for for how the problem might be solved. The next strand of mathematical proficiency is adaptive reasoning. Adaptive reasoning refers to a child or student's capacity for logical thought, reflection, explanation, and justification regarding the relationships among concepts and situations while solving mathematical problems or equations. In mathematics, adaptive reasoning is the glue that holds everything together. Students use it to navigate through the many facts, procedures, concepts, and solution methods, and see that they all fit together in some way and that they make sense. In mathematics, deductive reasoning is used to settle disputes and disagreements. Answers are right because they follow from some agreed upon assumptions through a series of logical steps. One manifestation of adaptive reasoning is the ability to justify one's work. Students should be given regular opportunities to talk about the concepts and procedures they're using and to provide good reasons for what they are doing. Classroom norms can be established in which students are expected to justify their mathematical claims and make them clear to others. Students need to be able to justify and explain ideas in order to make their reasoning clear, hone their reasoning skills, and improve their conceptual understanding. The final strand of mathematical proficiency is called productive disposition. This refers to a child or student's habitual inclination to see mathematics as sensible, useful, and worthwhile, as well as the ability to believe in their own self-efficacy. Maintaining a positive attitude about math is integral to being able to develop necessary skills across all the components of mathematical proficiency. In order to develop a productive disposition, students must be given frequent opportunities to make sense of mathematics, to recognize the benefits of perseverance, and to experience the rewards of making sense of math. A student's disposition towards mathematics is a major factor in determining his or her educational success in this domain. Students who view their mathematical ability as fixed and test questions as measuring their ability rather than providing them opportunities to learn are likely to avoid challenging problems and to be easily discouraged by failure. Students who view ability as expandable in response to experience and training are more likely to seek out challenging situations and learn from them. Students who have developed a productive disposition are confident in their knowledge and ability. They see that mathematics is both reasonable and intelligible and believe that with appropriate effort and experience, they can learn. All right, now it's time to review. <clears throat> Since we'll be discussing a lot of information this evening, we'll be taking moments to stop and reflect on the information learned during each section of our presentation. So let's stop and reflect on what we've just learned about specific learning disorders in mathematics and the foundation of math. First, we learned that there are various terms for a specific learning disorder in mathematics, such as dyscalculia and math learning disability. 
There are two types of mathematics that are learned informally and formally. Cardinality plays a pivotal role in the development of numeracy skills. And in order to engage in mathematical learning, there are two prerequisite skills that children and students must develop. These skills are number sense and counting. And there are five foundational components that make up mathematical proficiency. They are conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, strategic competence, adaptive reasoning, and productive disposition. In the following section, Claire will discuss the primary areas of mathematical instruction. Okay, so now that we discussed the five strands of math proficiency, Let's discuss the five areas for math instruction as cited by the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. The National Council of Teachers of Mathematics lists expectations for each of the following at each grade level. If you are looking for more information on, spe on specific expectation for your student or child's grade level. Okay, so numbers and operations involves understanding numbers, ways of representing numbers, relationships among numbers, and number systems. Students should understand meanings of operations and how they relate to one another, such as adding and subtracting all the way to understanding and computing powers and roots. We also expect students to be able to compute fluently and make reasonable estimates. Again, expectations are listed on the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics website at each grade level. Algebra involves understanding patterns, relations, and functions. This may look like sorting, classifying, and ordering objects by size, number, and other properties, or looking at tables and graphs to analyze a pattern. Algebra also includes representing and analyzing mathematical situations and structures using algebraic symbols, such as using a letter or a symbol to represent the idea of an unknown variable. It also involves using mathematical models to represent and understand quantitative relationships. For example, using graphs, tables, and equations to draw conclusions. Lastly, algebra involves analyzing change in various contexts, such as investigating how a change in one variable relates to a change in a second variable. Geometry involves analyzing characteristics and properties of two and three dimensional geometric shapes and develop mathematical arguments about geometric relationships. It is also about specifying locations and describing spatial relationships using coordinate geometry and other representational systems. Geometry also involves applying transformations and use symmetry to analyze mathematical situations. In geometry, students also use visualization, spatial reasoning, and geometric modeling to solve problems. Measurement involves understanding measurable attributes of objects and the units, systems, and processes of measurement. For example, learning about length, volume, weight, area, and time. In addition, measurement is about applying appropriate techniques, tools, and formulas to determine measurement. Data analysis and probability includes formulating questions that can be addressed with data and collect, organize, and display relevant data to answer them. For example, posing a question and gathering data about yourself and the surroundings. This also involves selecting and using the appropriate statistical methods to analyze data, such as being able to describe the shape, the median, mean, and mode. Data analysis and probability also includes developing and evaluating inferences and predictions, as well as understanding and applying basic concepts of probability, 
which is an expectation for grade three and above. Now that we went through the areas of mathematics, we're going to discuss the underlying processes that take place when we engage in mathematical thinking, reasoning, and problem solving. The important processes that underlie mathematics are visual spatial skills, executive functioning, language, and memory. We'll talk about each of them individually. Starting with visual spatial skills. Visual spatial abilities, so encoding and mental manipulation of spatial information, as well as visual spatial working memory, our ability to remember visual spatial locations or sequences and manipulate that information in memory are important for mathematical performance. This is evident when we look at how young children begin to learn math. When they begin to do arithmetic using numbers, they typically draw on visual spatial resources to try and solve these problems, even when the math problems are presented orally. For example, when a student is asked to complete a multi-digit addition question, he or she might visually draw out the grouping of the numbers in order to solve the question. Additionally, for mathematical tasks, tasks such as estimation and some operations such as subtraction, it's been suggested that individuals use a mental number line. There are neuroimaging studies consistent with the idea that these types of mathematical operations are partly accomplished using neural circuits linked to visual spatial processing. Therefore, it is suggested that the use of visual mental models may be a beneficial strategy at any age when tackling a variety of complex mathematical tasks such as mathematical word problems, or when learning new math concepts. It is also important to note that current math curricula emphasize visual spatial concepts and executive thinking abilities, which may encourage children to employ strategies that draw on their visual spatial cognitive resources in a variety of mathematical problem solving situations. Now we'll discuss executive functioning. As you might recall from our previous week's presentations, executive functioning includes updating, inhibiting, and shifting. I will explain each of these processes using examples related to mathematics. Updating is when you learn new information. So you remember relevant information during the problem solving process and during the storage and retrieval of partial results. Inhibition may suppress inappropriate strategies. For example, you need to suppress addition rules when subtraction is required. Inhibition may also suppress information from a word problem that is irrelevant to the solution. Shifting skills may help with switching between operations, solution strategies, quantity ranges, and notations. For example, switching between verbal digits, written Arabic symbols, and non-symbolic quantity representations, and between the steps of a complex multi-step mathematical word problem. As Claire discussed previously, it is also important to understand mathematical language. Let's explore this idea more in depth. Language abilities underlie early mathematics learning and they continue to play a role in mathematical development throughout formal schooling. During early mathematic development, children need to use and understand concepts and terms to be able to understand the relationships between number words and quantities, like Claire discussed. The continued interrelated nature of language and mathematics is supported by a strong relationship between language and early math abilities. Research on the relationship between early mathematics and language has tended to focus on general language. However, in addition to the importance of general language abilities for mathematical skill development, emerging research suggests that mathematics specific language also matters. In fact, mathematical language has emerged as a significant predictor of later mathematical abilities over and beyond general language alone. Mathematical language is defined as keywords and concepts necessary for understanding and engaging in mathematical activities, and it's comprised of both quantitative language and spatial language. Quantitative language consists of keywords such as a lot and less, and spatial language consists of keywords such as below and before. Children who have difficulties with various aspects of mathematical language demonstrate struggles to attain particular mathematics skills.
Let's build on our understanding of working memory from previous weeks and assess how it relates to mathematics. Working memory is a limited capacity system that enables information to be temporarily temporarily stored and manipulated, and it has repeatedly been associated with, a, with academic performance. Research has shown that working memory is a significant predictor of achievement. As the demands of early mathematics skills become more complex, working memory requirements increase. For example, in mathematics, working memory capacity must increase as students move from solving simple calculations to completing complex applied math problems. In the latter, students must keep math vocabulary terms and their corresponding mathematical operations as well as the numbers present within the problem in order to solve it. Furthermore, verbal working memory is also related to the components of early mathematics that require multiple steps or maintaining information in memory such as calculation and number order. All right, so that was a lot of information. Let's take a minute to stop and reflect on what we just learned. Mathematical instruction spans five distinct content areas, numbers and operations, algebra, geometry, measurement, and data analysis and probability. As well, there are four processes that underlie mathematics. Those are visual spatial skills, executive functioning, language, and memory. So the skills and processes we just talked about are used by individuals who are able to efficiently engage in mathematics. However, some children and students that have difficulty with mathematics, which can show impairment in underlying neural circuits in the brain. The intraparietal sulcus, which is where the parietal lobe is on this diagram, is known to be the center for numerical processing. Research has illustrated that the IPS is activated when mathematical tasks and even simple counting exercises are carried out. Memory, perceptual and spatial, and motor functions are also involved in the process. Individuals with a learning disorder in math can show less activation in the intraparietal sulcus, which can explain difficulties with numerical processing. However, with intensive instruction, this area can show an increase in activation. All right, so now you can go to the link provided on the screen to view this checklist on your own computer. Um, take the next couple of minutes to fill it out. You can simply number a piece of paper or a computer document with numbers one through 14, and then put the corresponding score beside each of those numbers. Mark a line uh, with a zero if that particular challenge never or rarely affects you. A one if you sometimes experience those difficulties, a two if you often experience those difficulties in your daily life, and a three if those challenges affect you very often. We'll regroup after a couple minutes. Please note that you do not have to hand in your checklists. You can begin working on this task if you haven't already. Now that you've completed the checklist, I'd like to disclose that this list of difficulties or challenges are typically experienced by students who have a learning disability in mathematics. Something like this checklist can be used as a screening measure to indicate if further assessment in the area of mathematics is required. Typically, scores of 9 and above across all 14 items would warrant further evaluation. Now to gather and further our understanding of specific learning disorders with impairment in mathematics, let's explore how difficulties with math can affect your child or student's everyday routine. Let's call the student in this example, Sam. So it's 6 a.m. Sam knows she needs to take a quick shower and get ready for school. She thinks she's only been in the bathroom for a few minutes when her little brother bangs on the door. Come on, you've been in there for 30 minutes already, he yells. The challenges related to dyscalculia here is keeping track of time and estimating time. At 11 a.m., Sam has 
At 11 a.m., Sam has a science test that she studied really hard for. But after answering the first question, she starts to worry about how much time she has left. Her confidence sinks as she looks at the clock and thinks about how long it would take her to try to read it. She feels even worse as she tells herself she'd probably read the time wrong anyway. In this scenario, challenges related to dyscalculia includes telling time and self-esteem. At lunch, Sam wants to buy a $2 muffin for herself and a $5 box of cookies for her mom. She's not sure if she'll have enough money to buy both, but she doesn't want her friends to see her using her fingers to count. She hands over all the dollar bills she has and hopes it's enough. Here we see challenges with basic math facts and working with money. At 2 p.m., Sam looks at tonight's math homework and starts to panic. Even though she knows how to do some of the steps, her heart starts racing. I'm not going to be good at this, so why bother, she thinks. Sam tucks the worksheet into her bag before she leaves school. She doesn't want her dad to find the incomplete assignment. A related challenge for kids with math challenges is math anxiety. At 4 p.m., Sam is at a swimming lesson. Sam swims the first lap really quickly that she has trouble finishing the second lap. The swim instructor seems frustrated that Sam can't remember the pacing they practiced yesterday. Why is it so hard for her to remember one minute and 25 seconds? Challenges related to dyscalculia in this scenario is gauging speed and distance and remembering sequences of numbers. At 6 p.m., Sam needs to feed the pets before her family eats dinner. She knows Rover gets two-thirds of a cup of dog food and Pluto gets one-third of a cup of cat food. Did Sam measure it right? Which of the bowl has more? If Sam gives the dog too much food, he'll throw up. But how much is too much? Challenges related to dyscalculia here is understanding quantities and measuring. At 7 p.m., Sam is watching the Raptors on TV, but she has trouble telling which team is winning. If the point guard gets the next two free throws, will that be enough to go into overtime? Asking too many questions about the game embarrasses her, so she leaves to hide in her room. We see that Sam's difficulties with solving word problems, but also some social trouble due to embarrassment of her math difficulties. In this scenario, dyscalculia made it hard for Sam to make sense of numbers and concepts like bigger and smaller. For example, people may have trouble telling if a group of five apples is bigger than a group of three apples. This involves a set of skills called number sense. Researchers say it's like colorblindness. Just like some people are born having trouble telling the difference between colors, some people are born having trouble telling the difference between quantities. Now let's stop and reflect. So we talked about the cortical brain areas of mathematics that include the intraparietal sulcus, which is involved in numerical processing, such as simple counting exercises. This area shows a decrease in activation for children with a specific learning disorder in math. We also talked about common characteristics of math impairment through our example with Sam. This included difficulty with time, working with money, challenges understanding quantity, and solving word problems. All right, now what? What do we do if we suspect a student or child has a learning disability or challenges? For success, individuals with learning disabilities require early identification and timely specialized assessments and interventions involving home, school, community, and workplace settings. If you suspect your child might have a learning disability in math or other areas of academics, it will be important to have a thorough evaluation. You can receive this type of evaluation through your local school system or by a psychologist who works in private practice or medical center. Above all, the evaluation should be your first step in determining treatment. Following through with recommendations is the next step in making sure your child gets the help he or she needs. So where do we go 
if a child or adolescent is struggling to learn. The first step is to talk to school personnel. School personnel can put some supports in place without an assessment. However, if those difficulties persist despite the help provided, an assessment can be requested. In a school, the student will be put on a wait list. If an assessment cannot be completed in a timely manner at the school, it can be completed by a psychologist in private practice. The website listed has a list of psychologists in Alberta, and you could also search for psychologists in other cities that do psychoeducational assessments. Some resources in Calgary that do psychoeducational assessments are the Integrated Services in Education and CanLearn. All right, this section will mostly be reviewed for those of you who were present last week and the week before, but it's important to discuss for those of you who were not present at either of those presentations. Some of you might be wondering, what is a psychoeducational assessment and what does it entail? A psychoeducational assessment occurs when trained professionals investigate your child or student's strengths as well as their areas of difficulty. It's conducted in a holistic manner in which professionals aim to gain a cohesive understanding of your child or student's academic, social, emotional, and behavioral functioning across multiple domains, such as at home, at school, and within the community. This allows professionals to gather necessary information to determine the root cause of your child or student's difficulties. It also helps to inform recommendations or suggestions that can utilize your child's strengths to help enhance their skill set in areas that are personally challenging for him or her. A typical a psychoeducational assessment consists of four primary parts, an intake meeting, cognitive testing, academic testing, and additional testing. Now we'll briefly go through each part. The first part of the intake meeting involves discussing the client's legal rights, limits to confidentiality, and the actual assessment process. So what's involved, the types of assessments we'd like to conduct, and what each of those assessments will investigate. The following step at the intake meeting involves clarifying the purpose of the assessment, why parents and or teachers are seeking a psychoeducational assessment for their child or student. This is where the psychologist will verify the specific referral questions with parents. These questions are a way of specifically communicating what's being investigated during the assessment. After the referral questions are determined, the psychologist will proceed to the history taking step. Throughout this step, the psychologist will ask questions about the child's developmental history, their cognitive, academic, and social, emotional, behavioral functioning across their lifespan from birth until present time. They'll also ask for specific uh, examples pertaining to your child's behavior at home, at school, and in the community when he or she is partaking in a favorite activity versus any differences in functioning when they're completing a non-preferred activity or task. The next step in the psychoed assessment process is the one that most parents and teachers are aware of, cognitive testing. There are five types of cognitive reasoning that are evaluated during this part of the assessment. The first is verbal reasoning. This is your child or student's ability to take in verbal information, use words to compare ideas, and then explain what they know. The next is visual spatial reasoning. This helps individuals design, draw, build, and navigate their environment. Fluid reasoning is the third one. This is the ability to think about patterns, sequences, and quantities. Working memory is an individual's ability to hold simple auditory or visual information in their mind and manipulate it in order to determine an answer to a question. Processing speed is the last type of reasoning that's assessed during a cognitive assessment or cognitive testing. And this is how quickly and accurately individuals can understand information to complete tasks. And as we've discussed previously in the presentation, difficulties in certain areas of cognitive reasoning, such as working memory and processing speed, can impede students' mathematical abilities. All right, so the following step in the psychoeducational assessment process is academic testing. This assessment will investigate your child or student's abilities across three primary domains, so reading, writing, and mathematics. Today, we'll discuss more in-depth mathematics. Specific areas of math that are evaluated are calculation. 
So your child or student's abilities to accurately and fluently compute basic math calculations involving things like fractions, place value, using money, or analyzing data on a graph. And then there's math fluency. This is your child or student's ability to quickly and accurately solve simple equations involving basic mathematical operations, such as addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And then applied problem solving. This focuses on your child or student's understanding of mathematical concepts and their application of computational skills. Additionally, it also focuses on whether or not your child or student is able to identify and follow steps required to solve a mathematical word problem. So the final step usually before you get to a possible feedback meeting with information about recommendations or possible diagnosis is additional testing. Additional testing is sometimes required in order to rule out potential diagnoses. Sometimes academic difficulties can be the result of underlying challenges in areas such as executive functioning, social emotional behavioral functioning, adaptive functioning, visual motor integration, or sometimes language difficulties. Problems with executive functioning might look like a child or student is having difficulties organizing their thoughts in order to create a plan for how to solve a math problem, or they're experiencing difficulties or challenges following multi-steps that are typically required in order to engage in the problem solving process. Social emotional behavioral functioning might manifest as emotional outbursts, such as fear, anxiety, or worry about completing a task that involves math, or even avoiding tasks that involve math completely. And then adaptive functioning difficulties may appear as challenges engaging in tasks of daily living, such as taking the bus to get to school, maintaining one's personal hygiene, or engaging in basic foundational academic skills, such as telling time. And then visual motor integration difficulties might appear as challenges writing numbers in a proper format. Students with difficulties in this area may reverse the positions of loops and connecting lines in numbers when they write them out. And then language processing challenges can include difficulties using and understanding basic vocabulary concepts required to complete academic activities across the curriculum. All right, so this might seem a bit ironic, but now we're going to recap what we just reviewed from last week. It's time to stop and reflect on what we've just relearned. There are four primary parts in the psychoeducational assessment process, the intake meeting, cognitive testing, academic testing, and additional testing. Additional testing sometimes occurs in the areas of executive functioning, social emotional behavioral functioning, adaptive functioning, visual motor integration, and language development. All psychoeducational testing is conducted to understand your child or student's academic profile. Psychologists are able to do this by using the different tests mentioned above to collect evidence of your child or student's strengths and areas of difficulty. This information is then used when determining which empirical recommendations will address your child or student's unique learning needs. Okay, so it's important to note that learning disabilities often coexist with, the, with various conditions, including attentional, behavioral, and emotional disorders, which further adds to academic difficulties. The most common co-occurring disorder is ADHD. This is why, as Ocean discussed in the assessment process, we often look at multiple areas of functioning that includes behavioral, emotional and academic. There are a few measurement techniques used in psychoeducational um, reports that are norm referenced and standard standardized to help understand the report. We went over this the last two weeks, but for those of you who are new, that is joining us this week, I'll go over it briefly. So during the standardization process, the test is given to a large number of students from various backgrounds to determine what is average, low average, high average, et cetera. This allows us to compare a child's score to thousands of other students who are part of the normative sample. So we can say Johnny is doing as well as students his age. Norms can be reported as percentile ranks. A percentile rank of 60 
corresponds to a performance that is as good as or better than 60% of one same age peers. Average percentile ranks fall between 25 and 75. Standard scores estimate whether a student's score are above average, average, or below average compared to peers. A child or adolescent struggling in math would usually be about two standard deviations from the mean in the extremely low to low range on this graph. This is an example of an assessment done with a grade four girl. For her cognitive assessment, she's had scores in the low average to average range. So we would expect her academic scores to be around the low average to average range. However, we can see she is struggling in math fluency. Math fluency was in the fourth percentile in the low range. This is likely due to her difficulties in basic math as she was only able to complete single digit questions. She does perform better when the math task is untimed, however. So we know there is something going on with the student's math fluency. This student was diagnosed with a moderate specific learning disorder in mathematics, specifically with impairment in accurate and fluent calculations. It was considered moderate because she has been given small group instruction in mathematics at school and continued to have these difficulties. Now it's important to understand how psychologists end up determining which recommendations to provide and how they reach potential diagnoses. This is, this is accomplished through the diagnostic decision-making process. The diagnostic decision-making process begins once a psychologist receives your case file. This information will guide the questions they ask at an intake meeting. Then based on the information gathered at the meeting, psychologists will determine potential diagnoses that are important to explore in order to gain a comprehensive understanding of how your child or student functions at home, at school, and within the community. Moving on to step two, the list of possible diagnoses being queried will guide the specific assessments that are chosen. Through these assessments, the psychologist will gather information, which we refer to as evidence. This evidence will be used during steps three and four. In step three, the psychologist will critically evaluate all the evidence from testing, including both students' responses to questions, as well as their behavior across domains in order to comprehensively understand how your child or student is functioning each day in multiple environments. This information will help the psychologist determine which of the hypothesized difficulties do not accurately explain the challenges your child or student is experiencing, and those conditions will be ruled out. Based on the previous example, Sam's fine motor skills and the visual motor integration should be evaluated prior to reaching a diagnosis. Following this process, in step four, the psychologist will review the gathered evidence to determine if there is enough information to support diagnosing any of the remaining conditions that were hypothesized. Sometimes there is sufficient evidence to make one or more diagnoses. Other times the information collected does not align with the criteria within the DSM or LDAC, and as a result, it is inappropriate to provide a diagnosis. So when a child is diagnosed with a learning disorder or disability, a code is given. A code for a learning disability is a code 54 in Alberta. If a child or student has multiple diagnosis, the diagnosis that most interferes with school will be the code that is written down. An example of this may be if a child is diagnosed with both ADHD and a learning disability. The school may decide to focus on the student's ADHD first if it is impacting the student's ability to learn and pay attention before working on academic areas. The code is given so that additional supports may be determined at any time during the school year. It is the responsibility of school authority staff to assign a special education code to a student, which is based on documentation. 
An assessment is designed to offer guidance to school authorities regarding Alberta education's expectations for assessment practices and is done by psychologists in a psychoeducational assessment. The code allows schools to ensure appropriate interventions of specific skill instruction, accommodations, compensatory strategies, and self-advocacy skills. As parents and teachers, if there needs to be a modification to the IPP, it is important to self-advocate for a meeting with school staff to look over the IPP to make those modifications. In order to get information on IPP planning during the pandemic, I interviewed a teacher who is currently working at Calgary Catholic District School Board. IPP planning for online learning is a little different because you won't be able to have that in-person support at home. However, the instructions and activities are developmentally appropriate. There are strategies that can still be implemented in online learning, such as extra time, reduced questions, visual pairings with written instructions and assignments, installing text-to-speech software, just to name a few. When switching to online learning, it is important to meet with the school to discuss the IPP. All activities are structured around that student's IPP and grade level of programming, so the student may get a more developmentally appropriate assignment to complete. All right, so now let's again stop and reflect on what we just learned. The standardized testing ensures that comparisons can be drawn between a child and similar aged peers. Percentile scores are presented on a standardized distribution or the bell curve. There are four main steps in diagnostic decision making that Ocean discussed, and students diagnosed with a learning disorder are given a code by the school which helps with providing supports. So now we are going to go over some recommendations and suggestions. We are going to start with the foundational recommendations in math and work our way through more complex processes in math such as problem solving. These are not exhaustive but just some of the recommendations that we would most often start with. When we think recommendations for mathematics, we often think, what would this look like in the classroom? However, it is first important to remember the mathematical learning and reasoning are not unique to this setting and that children regularly engage with mathematics in their everyday lives. Children can learn foundational math concepts through daily activities such as baking, counting money, playing with blocks, and experimenting at home. Parents and children are often not conscious of these crucial learning moments that are developed through play. Through these activities, children are exposed to the concepts of measurement, number sense, geometry, and problem solving, which are foundational to the learnings that will follow in the classroom. Some algorithm strategies can be useful for students when they are learning addition, subtraction, or multiplication. They can be printed out and the student can keep it in their desk as a reminder when doing math. Touch math is a multi-sensory technique. It places counting points on numbers to help students understand how a symbol represents a quantity. It also helps in counting numbers as an alternative method to using fingers. Abstract ideas in math should be approached using verbal, such as number stories, pictorial, such as drawings, symbolic, such as number models, and concrete, such as counters representations. Strategic number counting 
could look like starting at the larger number in addition and counting the smaller number onto the larger number. It can also be helpful to use flashcards or number lines with this strategy. Drill in practice is the most familiar. Math facts may appear for a few seconds and students must reproduce the whole equation and the answer. Detect, practice, repair is as follows. In the detect phase, there are timed exercises to determine automatic versus slow math fact reasoning. The practice phase is using cover, copy, compare, which I will explain soon. And the repair phase is using one minute math exercises with items requiring practice embedded in those questions that are automatic. Cover, copy, compare is looking at a math problem, covering it up, copying it down on paper, and then evaluating response compared to the original. Error correction is done before the next item is introduced. Lastly, reciprocal peer tutoring is when students are paired and take turns being the tutor. The tutor may have flashcards and the other student will respond. Many students, especially those with learning disabilities, perform reasonably well on low-level math skills such as calculation, but have difficulty with the higher-level skills needed for problem-solving and applications. To solve word problems successfully, students must not only be able to perform the necessary computations, but they must also understand the questions that are being asked, identify the relevant information within the problem, and determine the specific operations needed to solve the problem. One way to work on mathematical problem solving skills is to engage in schema theory instruction. This involves explicitly instructing students on how to recognize, understand, and solve problems based on mathematical structures, and then teaching them how to generalize these skills when attempting to complete novel problems. These steps encourage students to create math problem solving schemas for word problems to identify new unfamiliar or unnecessary information and to group novel problem features into a more broad schema for strategy use. Another way to enhance students' mathematical problem solving is through the self-regulated strategy development framework that we discussed last week. Self-regulated learning strategies such as the fast drum and mnemonic are helpful for mathematical problem solving. This mnemonic is an eight-step process for initiating, planning, organizing, computing, and checking one's work while engaging in mathematical problem solving. It can be used as a checklist for the steps involved in problem solving while they are, while students are trying to utilize their mathematical skills. FASTRA stands for F, find and highlight what you're solving for. A, ask, what is important information? Find and circle numbers and phrases. S, set up the equation by writing and labeling the numbers in correct order. T, tie down the equation by solving the problem if you can, or solve using draw. D, discover the sign by rechecking the operation. Circle the sign and say the name of the operation. R, read the problem. A, answer the problem if you know how, or draw pictures to try to solve it. W, write the answer and check to see if it makes sense. The third way you can teach mathematical problem solving is through cognitive strategy instruction. This involves uh, providing students with a step-by-step -step process to guide their problem solving. A typical step-by-step -step process may look like the one outlined on the slide. First, read the problem for understanding. Second, paraphrase, paraphrase the problem in your own words. Third, visualize a picture or diagram to accompany the written problem. Four, Hypothesize a plan to solve the problem. Five, estimate or predict your answer. Six, compute the answer. Seven, check your answer. And a specific program that might be helpful for students experiencing mathematical challenges is called On Cloud Nine. This program helps students develop their ability to visualize and verbalize the concepts and processes involved in math. Through this program, concept imagery and numeral energy, 
imagery are integrated with language to improve both mathematical reasoning and mathematical computation. Students will begin with simple tasks such as visualizing and writing numbers, followed by visualizing the number line, skip counting, and so on. This program uses blocks and flashcards to facilitate learning and ensures a deeper conceptual understanding of mathematical concepts. All right, so we talked about a lot today and we want to provide you with some key takeaways that you must be aware of um, or that you should be aware of. There are multiple terms for a specific learning disorder with impairment in mathematics. Sometimes it's called dyscalculia and sometimes it can be referred to as a learning disability in math. And then there are um, and then a specific learning disorder with impairment in mathematics typically occurs when a student or your child has difficulties with number sense, memorization of arithmetic facts, completing accurate or fluent calculations, and or challenges engaging in accurate math reasoning. This may be indicative of a specific learning disorder. And then we also learned that there are specific cortical areas of the brain, such as the interparietal sulcus, that help with mathematics. And impairment in these areas may be related to some children's mathematical challenges. And then we also learned that since every child's learning profile is unique, we tailor supports and recommendations to their individual learning needs. This is done through a comprehensive psychoeducational assessment. Students with a learning disorder with impairment in mathematics will receive a special education code, and this code ensures that they will receive supports throughout their education through an individualized program plan, also known as an IPP. And the next few slides are all the references that we used in our presentation. And now we'd just like to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to us today and for possibly attending our previous presentations as well. Our presentation and an additional resource page will be provided to you upon request. We're also open to answering any questions you may have from our presentation. And then if we're unable to answer your questions today, please email them to ces at ahs.ca.